Breaking news. And joining us now here on the Rita Cosby Show, there is enormous news on the front about President Biden and his future. And joining us now is the great investigative journalist John Solomon of Just the News. John, what do you know? There are buzz reports out there now all over the place saying that there's a very good chance that President Biden could leave the 2024 race, still stay in the White House, but leave the race in a matter of days. What are you hearing? Yeah, listen, I talked to two senior White House officials. They believe that will be the ultimate outcome, but they caution that the president himself has not yet made the decision. Uh, They believe he's moving in that direction, that he's able to read the tea leaves of where his Democratic Party is, but he's sick with COVID. He wants to get better first. He wants to have these discussions with his family. Uh, I talked about six horses total. They believe that this will be resolved by early next week and as early as Saturday. Um, the, the most senior people I talk to think that the president, their gut tells them the president will drop out, but he himself has not yet decided to do that. He wants to work through the process, but he understands a president who doesn't have his party behind him or a good part of his party behind him can't continue into the general election. So I think we're at a very critical moment. We'll know a lot, maybe as early as Saturday, late as Monday, but they think this will be resolved in just a few days. Now remember, just a week ago, the president was defined. I'm not getting out there are signs that that maybe that sentiment is beginning to crack in a big way and john solomon there are a couple headlines tonight that are saying that he might actually drop out um as early as this week and that he has decided you're saying that's a little premature i think that's right Listen, i think the people around him think that that's where he's going but the president himself has not made that decision he hasn't signed on the dotted line uh and when you're sick you know you sometimes just want to kick that down the road a little bit COVID is a tough thing to have especially when you're older uh i think there's some excitement you know belief that this is going to result in a transition if he drops out the people i've talked to think he won't endorse someone he'll let the the party decide since he's wow that's a biggie so he yeah. won't endorse even his vice president kamala that's, harris the senior thinking is that that's where his head is right now again this could change uh it would be natural for them to do the uh come out kamala harris as his successor for many reasons one she's already on the ballot gets rid of some of the ballot issues two there's 200 million dollars sitting in a, pit, a bank account that can't be spent if she's not on the ticket. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of things to be worked out yet. uh, But I think the the most important thing is that the president's mindset is beginning to change. That's what we're hearing from people who know him best, but he has not yet made that decision. Anyone says he's made a decision, not there yet. I do think Saturday to Monday is the window to watch. Wow. So as early as this Saturday, we could hear from the current commander in chief that he has decided what, maybe some address to the nation to let the world know? Yeah. No one I talked to had had an idea what it would be, but if it would, it probably be something like that. I think the nation would want to hear from the president directly. Why are you doing this? Now, he could turn around and double down again and be in the race. And, uh, you know, I think one of the things he's wrestling with, I hear, is that the president understands he was, uh, he went through a whole primary system. Millions of people voted for him. Why does he, he, do, he may not want to let those people down. So that's what's tugging at him. The realization his party's not with him. Millions of people took the time to vote for him. And is he letting them down? That's the fulcrum upon which this decision is going to be made. And uh, other big news. Um, We are going to hear from President Trump. We're going to take it live, everybody, here on the Rita Cosby Show. You got a little sneak peek, my friend, of what he's about to say. Fill us in. Yeah, listen, he's going to make an extraordinary call for unity. I would say he wants to make America one again. He's always wanted to make it great again. He wants to make it one again. This is the most important excerpt, I think, early in the speech. Together, we're going to launch a new era of safety, prosperity, and freedom for citizens of every race, religion, uh, color, and creed. The discord and division in our society must be healed. As Americans, we are bound together by a single fate and a shared destiny. We rise together or we fall apart. I am running to be president for all of America, not half of America, because there is no victory in winning for just half of America. Very powerful words. A call for unity. Make America one again. Wow, very powerful. And this is going to be a rousing applause. This is the first time we have seen him speak yeah. since the assassin's bullet that grazed his ear. He still has the bandage he at does. least earlier tonight when he came into the hall. It was a thunderous applause. Yeah. You and I were there. Um, and, and you saw that moment and experienced that moment. How much 
of a moment for everybody here at the Republican National Convention. It's going to be incredible. I can't imagine just the tears in people's eyes to see him up there. It has been a tumultuous five days. It's really been a tumultuous couple of months. Major court rulings and uh, the throwing out of his uh, criminal case, uh, the ruling on immunity, uh, the debate, uh, and then, of course, the assassination attempt. Yes, I think there will be uh, tears. There will be tears of happiness, tears of relief, uh, but also a determination that they know that being up in the polls now four months early doesn't mean anything, that they've got to close this deal. And I think in the speech, the president walks through how he wants to close the deal with Americans in every walk, in every state of this country. You know, uh, I have to ask you, as we are talking, of course, about the assassin's bullet, John Solomon, uh, you always have such great scoops. What is the latest on that and the latest on the shooter? Because we are now learning details that when he went to the magnetometer at that rally in Pennsylvania on Saturday, that apparently he drew some suspicion. They had a suspicious uh, person's report. They took pictures of him. Is that true that an hour before this shooting took place that there was actually some intel that there was someone fishy walking around the information that's been relayed to congress that which is sort of spotty still so we don't have a complete picture is that for nearly an hour there were multiple reasons to be suspicious of this person the secret service agents themselves labeled him a person of suspicion but they had not uh, determined he had been a threat until he got on the roof and began firing there seems to have been a gap in the notification on the outer rim who saw the guy setting up to shoot and in the interim that was protecting the president. The president's team says they never got any warning that there was even a suspicious person in the crowd, uh, so they weren't able to react to it. The single most important thing that happened today is that Jim Jordan, the chairman of the House Judiciary Committee, has uh, announced that they have multiple whistleblowers from the Secret Service, multiple whistleblowers who've come forward saying that the Secret Service knew going into this event in Butler, Pennsylvania that they were under-resourced. They did not have the appropriate source package resource package to protect the president fully that is probably where this story we talked about this a couple days ago i think that's where this kind of stories end they went in without enough resources they didn't adapt or ask the president to change the event and instead they put the president in very much harm's way that's amazing so what you're saying john solomon tonight and everybody uh breaking now with all these new details is that there was not enough resources so they couldn't allegate enough people you know i i, I you hear that but john you and i have covered so many yep. White House events and other events, and I'm sitting there saying, um, how could this be? Even if they only have 10 people, you would have thought one of the 10 would be That's near right. that roof. That's, the That's an obvious, think. and then that Secret Service director tonight yep. has been dodging people where we are here at the Republican yeah. National Convention, yeah. John Sullivan. You can't make it up. The, the senators are chasing her down, and she's ignoring them, hanging out at the parties, as opposed to giving the details to Congress. Yeah, listen, I don't think she's winning any fans with her performance the last four or five days. And I remember a few months ago, James Comer revealed to us that there were agents circulating a petition inside the Secret Service saying that their leadership was letting them down. There were warning signs that this agency was in distress. Um, But yeah, if it was not properly resourced, the right thing that the Secret Service should have done is either tell the president, we can't protect you adequately, we should move the event, delay the event, uh, or bring additional resources in, but not to go in with a half package or an incomplete package when lives are at stake and the threat levels going up against President Trump, as we knew from an Iranian threat. Listen, there's a lot we're going to learn, but uh, if these whistleblowers are telling Congress the truth, they're saying it was clear in documents beforehand that they did not feel they were properly resourced. Wow. And let me ask you about the fact that the parents actually called the police that yeah. day, the parents of the shooter. Yeah. Uh, that's not normal. It's a no, 20-year-old, it's it's and not. they said when he's gone, is the car is missing. That clearly shows that they were worried about the mental stability, you would think, of their son. What do we know about this assassin and what was going on? There were reports that he was making threats and also doing searches online yeah. for Trump and also for Biden, too, as well. Yeah, that's what we're hearing tonight. Uh, the mother and father are trained social workers. They're trained to identify people who are in distress. Something that morning, that day, 
made them concerned that their son had left and not come back home. Uh, they made an initial uh, report to police. And then, of course, when the man, when the young man gets to the site, he's walking around and his behavior is triggering other people who think he's suspicious. He's acting in a way that looked threatening. Uh, and no one puts the pieces together until the bullets start flying and one nicks the president. So um, there are lots of things. And we have some gaps in the story. We don't know everything yet. We're going to learn a lot more. But the early picture is that there were warning signs about this young man, at least on the day of, on the hour before at the scene. And the Secret Service didn't, and the people they were working with, didn't put the right security measures in place to protect the president. I think you're going to find communication gaps between the outer rim and the inner rim of the Secret Service protection and the resourcing are probably going to be two things that are going to become very key in the future. One of the local authorities uh, came out today and he's saying, we were only brought in, we weren't brought in to look at the roof, yeah. we were brought in to yeah. basically do traffic. Yeah. I mean, you can't make it up. So it's like a lot of finger pointing tonight. There's been a lot of changes in the Secret Service's early story. It wasn't the re- responsibility to cover the roof. It's the local for- enforcement's uh, fault. Then it's not the local enforcement's fault. Then it was we knew about the roof. And then it was because the agents didn't want to go on a sloped roof. Listen, I know Secret Service agents, they don't give a darn if they're on a slope roof. They're going to do what it takes to protect it. There are just some elements of the early Secret Service story that doesn't seem to make sense. Absolutely. Well, John Solomon, thank you. You are terrific. You always have the best thank scoops. You. Keep us posted, please, I will. my friend. Great to be with you. Thank you so much.